December 3rd, 2020. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we do ask you to be on mute unless you have a question or you have uh, something that you wish to uh, speak on. Um, one of the, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a, a roll call of membership uh, just to verify who's on the, on the line with us today. Um, Annette Shepard from my staff will be conducting that and if you can just uh, briefly say aye or, or wave uh, if you're on video, uh, that will suffice. Uh, so Annette, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, Please enter the meeting path. Oh. <laughs> so uh, Annette, if you can uh, go ahead and uh, pull the uh, members of the committee. Okay. Anthony Beach. Keith Bond. Christy Bonham. Here, present. Uh, Amy Berlarley Highland. Thomas Dahl. Present. Leola Davis. Mitch Davison. Chief Dixon. Zane Dunham. Present. Okay. Uh, Joseph Dvorsky. Uh, Victor Gable. I'm here. Okay. Uh, David Gonzalez. Okay. Bridget Gonzalez. Uh, Jeff Jackson. Here. Okay. Jim Jaska. Francisco Leos. Here. Uh, Joel Martinez. Carl McNair. Matt Metters. Clint Peters. Serena Stevenson. Present. Matthews. Debbie Tahiri. Hello, everyone. Uh, Clayton Zaka. I'm here. Okay. All right, and we have uh, some other folks that are with us today. Uh, Barbara Maley, I, I see you're here. Uh, Barbara is from the Federal Highway Administration. Um, and Brenton Lane, I see that you're on the call. I am. All right, uh, Brenton's from the Waco District of TxDOT. Uh, and then uh, for uh, there are some folks uh, joining us from TxDOT in Austin for the conversation about the national highway system. And so if those folks don't mind uh, letting us know your presence. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, this is Akila Tamarasan. I'm with uh, TxDOT TPP. Good afternoon, this is Nishant Kukuria. I'm a consultant helping TechStart. Hi there, it's Alex Cantero. I'm also a consultant with TechStart. Okay. Anyone and anyone else who has joined us that we missed? Looks like Amy just joined us. Amy. Mm -hmm. Yep. I've got Amy. All right, great. <laughs> All right, so thank you for your patience with that process. Uh, with a virtual process, it takes a little bit longer to verify who's uh, participating. So we thank you for your patience. Um, so let me go ahead and <clears throat> share the PowerPoint here and we'll go ahead and get started. And so, um, <clears throat> The next item is reading of any kind of public comments that we may have received. Um, I have not received any comments. And I don't believe anyone else on my staff have, so we will pass through uh, that part of the agenda at this time. And we'll move right into the discussion on proposed changes to or proposed designation changes as part of the national highway system. Uh, so real quick, the National Highway System was established uh, by Congress in 1991. The intent of this uh, system was to identify the most important highways for moving people and goods uh, between metropolitan areas and other important uh, destination points. 
uh, the, something like the Port of Houston would be an example of one of those important destination points. Uh, and then Congress also set aside a pot of money uh, to ensure that that system functions at a satisfactory level. Uh, make sure that we've got a good state of repair and also that we have enough capacity to handle the traffic volumes and freight flows along that uh, highway. Now, as you can imagine, the NHS system is a very small subset of the entire highway network. Um, and that was by design. Uh, however, uh, and this says FAST Act. Actually, we've slept a few nights since we um, uh, this actually took place. That really, I want to say MAP 21. It's a little bit earlier uh, than the FAST Act. Uh, but Congress added a number of uh, facilities to the NHS system uh, by saying all principal arterials were now automatically part of the NHS system. The challenge with that is that the funding didn't change. Uh, and so now we have this uh, challenge of uh, ensuring that that system uh, maintains the original intent and goals that Congress established for the NHS system. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we wanted to do, it's been a little while since anyone's done a thorough review of the NHS system, uh, almost 30 years uh, to be exact. Uh, so we wanted to go through an exercise to verify uh, that the current system makes sense and also to uh, identify those facilities uh, that were added into the system and, and make sure that they really belong there uh, and if not uh, make the appropriate uh, changes so that the system actually uh, meets the goals and the intent that Congress set up initially. So TxDOT's provided us several slides here to help us uh, walk, uh, walk through this process. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are several folks from uh, TxDOT and their consultant here that can answer specific questions if you have any. Uh, we're going to just kind of slide through these fairly quickly uh, and then get to uh, the proposed changes. And, um, and Chris, real quick, we wanted to point out that there are a few extra slides that are in the packet PDF that was available on our website, um, but we took some of them out of the actual presentation for um, time's sake. Right, right. And thank you for reminding me of that. Um, and so we do, and we, if you have a question regarding those additional slides, uh, feel free to, to uh, speak up on those. But I think most of those were just kind of um, um, fairly, um, 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 were things that we could uh, uh, move past fairly quickly. So uh, timeline here, uh, this is something that's uh, actually taken a, a fair amount of time to uh, work through uh, because this is bigger than just uh, what the Waco MPO is working on. The entire state of Texas is going through this process at the same time. In fact, actually uh, just about the entire country is doing a, a pretty comprehensive review of the system uh, over the last several years. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we're trying to make sure of is that uh, there's consistency uh, between metropolitan areas, but also statewide and also with other states. Uh, and so that's a process that takes a, a, a fair amount of time. Um, and so, uh, but we're now towards the uh, end of this process here uh, with some of the uh, uh, final steps. Uh, so we've already done a review with TxDOT uh, that actually occurred uh, early last year and uh, we ca came up with a set of changes uh, to then vet through the uh, Texas Division of Federal Highways uh, to get their feedback. Uh, they have, uh, TxDOT and Federal Highways have circled back around to us uh, back in July uh, on the result of that review. And so now we are bringing this to both uh, the Technical Committee and Policy Board uh, to uh, determine uh, your level of concurrence with uh, the proposed uh, changes. And then once we act here, uh, these will then be submitted to Federal Highways for uh, the final decision. And it's Federal Highways that uh, makes the uh, final approvals of any changes to the system. And so our, our uh, exercise here is basically one of making a recommendation. And as you'll see here, sometimes the MPO and, and TxDOT may have a difference of opinion. And so then it's up to Federal Highways 
to assess which one had which opinion has uh, more merit, uh, and then uh, to um, then um, justify you know why they're going one direction or the other. And then once uh, Federal Highways makes their decision, that's when the um, uh, text updates their maps, and that's when those changes become official. So there are several uh, considerations uh, for the national highway system that um, take us from the more um, 30,000 foot uh, kind of abstract view of most important facilities uh, to help us uh, uh, use some criteria to make that decision. So we're looking at major activity centers, we're looking at uh, long distance travel, um, connecting regions, um, which I've mentioned earlier. Um, and then um, what we don't want is uh, facilities that are just uh, providing internal circulation within a region. Um, and then one of the cardinal sins of the NHS system is we also don't want a spur that just kind of dead ends somewhere. That's not a really important destination point. And we do have a few of those as a result of the MAP 21 um, uh, actions from uh, Congress. And so we wanted to clean that up as well. Uh, so there are actually two separate processes here. Uh, there was the uh, act actual review of the principal arterial system that that's what primarily applied to us uh, there really aren't any intermodal connectors within our region but there are some in some of the other regions and that was kind of a separate process here but that that did not apply to our region here um, and just a reminder here that uh, we've now been through several iterations of um, performance targets uh, especially on the safety and transit asset management side. But um, for things like pavement and bridge condition, travel time reliability, um, these are things that uh, we track under federal law, but only for the national highway system. So this is a very relevant discussion as far as what we're tracking in terms of uh, these uh, targets and whether we are going to uh, help the state meet these targets or, um, or whether there's additional uh, things we need to be doing to uh, help uh, the state achieve the, the targets that they've identified. Uh, so there are a couple of slides here about uh, facts from the National Highway System. Uh, this is for the entire state of Texas here and what you can see here is about one in five miles of uh, uh, was added as a result of the MAP 21 action. Um, but um, for our region, it's a much more significant percentage of the total. In fact, uh, we uh, effectively tripled the amount of miles uh, within our region as a result of uh, the MAP 21 action. And so there, there was quite a bit of cleanup we felt uh, needed to be done to um, uh, get us back to the original intent of the NHS system. Uh, so TxDOT uh, did do a review of everything uh, based on a few uh, criteria that's easy to measure, things like traffic volume, which is the AADT uh, figure. Uh, what type of facility is it? Is it divided, undivided? Is it a freeway type design? Uh, which would get into access control and, and things like how wide of a of, of corridor is this? Uh, and they, they provided some um, scoring of uh, each of these criteria to give us some idea of whether a facility was a good candidate or rain on the system or not. And so that uh, started our conversation. Um, and then, um, the uh, slide we have uh, here about reviewing corridors, the, a lot of this gets back to some of the criteria that we uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and then there was also uh, looking at the underlying uh, classification of the roadway. So is it a principal arterial, minor arterial? Is it a freeway? Is it an interstate classification? And there's some criteria associated with that about how uh, those uh, facilities are spaced uh, and, and how those uh, facilities function. And that kind of loosely 
fits into this conversation as well, uh, because there's an un underlying uh, classification as well that's going to change with these proposed changes. Uh, so, uh, for uh, instance, the facilities that we're recommending to take off of the NHS system, we would actually be downgrading to a minor arterial designation. Uh, and so that's something else that uh, uh, to consider. And then the uh, facilities that we're proposing to add on would actually be upgraded to a principal arterial classification. Um, now, uh, one of the other things that we've had some conversation on, and we'll, we'll get back, uh, I don't think we necessarily have a definitive answer yet, uh, but that is the question of whether we can come back later and reclassify a facility uh, as a principal arterial, but not add it to the NHS system. And so that's, uh, you know, we'll probably be doing a more thorough review of the functional classification system in probably another two years. Uh, and so that's one of the things that uh, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, when we get to that process. All right, so let's look at uh, the NHS system and what we're proposing to modify within our region. Uh, and so um, the facilities that are in blue were originally uh, slated to remain uh, on the NHS system uh, as per our um, initial conversation. Uh, the corridors that are in red were proposed to be removed and basically through a cleanup process. Uh, these, these are facilities that we didn't feel met the original intent of Congress by, uh, for the NHS system. And then it's kind of hard to see on this map, but there is a section of US 77 south of Robinson and extending into Falls County that's green that would be added um, to the NHS system uh, as a part of our initial uh, discussion. And um, our the section we're worried about is the part that's within McLennan County. That's uh, about just short of three miles in length. But that uh, designate proposed addition actually would continue down US 77 all the way to Victoria. And one of the things that uh, uh, was cited was that Victoria is an, a port facility uh, and uh, US 77 is the most direct connection between that facility and say the Dallas-Fort Worth region. Uh, and so uh, it was felt that that uh, is from a statewide perspective, a fairly important facility. And so let's go through the uh, changes uh, which uh, were basically on the same page with the text dot on. Uh, and there, there are several uh, removals here that we'll cover. Um, there's a section of uh, 17th and 18th Street between Interstate 35 and LaSalle Avenue. A uh, section of Hewitt Drive from, uh, actually it's the entire length of Hewitt Drive from US 84 to Interstate 35. Uh, Martin Luther King Drive from Lakeshore Drive all the way to LaSalle. Franklin Avenue, uh, a small section of that between Waco Drive and Valley Mills Drive. A uh, section of Valley Mills Drive from Bishop Drive to the Waco Traffic Circle, and then Lakeshore Drive, once, which is basically a continuation of Valley Mills Drive, uh, from Bishop all the way back to US, 70, US Business 77 in Lacey Lakeview. And then there's a small portion of Loop 340 between Business 77 and I-35, which is a continuation of Lakeshore Drive, uh, that would also be removed. Now just uh, to let you know here, uh, Textile in some cases has a different nomenclature for some of these facilities. So if you look at the um, proposed uh, um, resolution, it's going to include both descriptions of each of these facilities, uh, just so that way there's no uh, confusion about which facility we're talking about or which section of facility. And then uh, for resolution 2020-8, uh, there's one addition, which I just mentioned is the section of US 77 uh, between uh, FM 2837 and the Falls County line. And uh, just as a reminder, this continues all the way down to Victoria uh, as part of the recommendation from Texton. 
Now there's another uh, change that came about as, or proposed change that came about as uh, part of this uh, iterative conversation between us, TxDOT, and the Federal Highway Administration. And I mentioned to you earlier that one of the cardinal sins of the NHS uh, system is that you don't have spurs that just end uh, without uh, a connection to something fairly important. Um, so we actually have that for you, a section of US 84 uh, that actually extends westward from Loop 340 through Woodway and actually ends currently at an area just beyond the McGregor Airport, approximately Val Verde Road. So under uh, the guidelines that uh, we have for the NHS system, um, if we didn't continue that NHS designation further west and all the way to another NHS facility, uh, the criteria would suggest removing that facility here. Um, let me also apologize here. I am from home and so you may see a cat uh, try to um, um, participate within our process. So we uh, we are not particular about it, participation within oh, our planning <laughs> process, but I will move her down. We're, we're not soliciting public comment at this moment. Sorry, Kat. Um, all right. So um, when MPO staff took a look at this, uh, we felt that there was some merit in continuing that NHS designation um, past our uh, area of jurisdiction, which would be, uh, which is McLennan County, uh, and at least as far as Gatesville, uh, which is where the north side of Fort Hood is. And, and those of you who are familiar with Fort Hood know that North Fort Hood uh, um, kind of acts and feels like a, a whole separate military facility in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, when there's deployment out for those units on the north side of Fort Hood, they use different facilities uh, than the main part of the base. Um, there is not currently another NHS facility that goes through Gatesville, however. Uh, there was some talk about using State Highway 36, but I think the recommendation is that that, that facility doesn't meet the criteria uh, for NHS uh, inclusion. So that means that now we're probably talking about going at least as far as US 281, which is at EVAMP, or maybe even as far as US 183, which is at Goldthwait. Now, if you went all the way to Goldthwait, that basically would complete a uh, connection all the way from Waco to Abilene. But, um, but there are a couple of things that uh, TxDOT has pointed out, which is, excuse me, uh, which are valid points and valid considerations. Uh, and that is that traffic volumes really drop off significantly once you get past Gatesville. Uh, and we already have a connection between Waco and Abilene using Highway 6 up to Eastland and then using Interstate 20 uh, from there to Abilene. Uh, and that connection has uh, considerably more traffic and considerably more freight traffic. Uh, so um, when we get to Resolution 2020-9, um, disagree, the language disagree we have here is probably strong. It's probably more like there's a difference of opinion uh, and that both sides have very valid points. Um, and for us, uh, the reason we're making this recommendation is that we just wanna make sure that this is something that is at least taken into consideration by federal highways uh, and acknowledging that uh, their um, decision uh, is the final decision and, and that we are comfortable with uh, uh, the decision that they will be ultimately, ultimately be making. Uh, so just to reiterate here, uh, TxDOT's recommendation is one that uh, there won't be a continuation of the NHS uh, uh, system um, for US 84 westward out of our region. And that uh, because of that, we would be removing uh, the section that's currently on the system that uh, is between State Highway 6 or Loop 340 uh, and approximately the McGregor Airport area that was added in as a result of the FAST Act. 
And then our recommendation, uh, which is uh, incorporated in, in the resolution, is that we would keep that section of uh, USA 4 on the system and extend it uh, through our region. Uh, but of course, that uh, recognizing that that is dependent on um, that designation being extended westward um, out of our region. Um, so at this time, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask uh, the folks from TxDOT and the consultants that are on uh, to see if there's anything else that uh, they'd like to add, anything that I didn't quite get 100% correct that might need to be uh, clarified, uh, and then open it up for any questions that the technical committee may have. Yes. Uh, hi, this is Akila from uh, Techstart. Uh, I think you made a wonderful presentation, Chris, and you covered it all very well. Uh, just a few minor points that I would like to add. Uh, well, first off, I would like to mention that uh, this is a periodic review process. Um, so we definitely understand uh, that developments happen or may not happen as we predict couple of years down the line. So this has to be a periodic update, periodic process. So we do have plans to come back in a few years and do the statewide evaluation again. Um, so we, let's not uh, think that once we make a decision that that is the end of it all for a particular facility. So that's something that I want to clarify on. Uh, and another point that uh, Chris had brought up earlier regarding functional classification and NHS designation, uh, it is possible um, to have uh, certain roadways as principal arterials and still not have them as NHS uh, uh, road facilities. So that's definitely possible. So we could definitely um, you know, discuss that. Um, right now, Techstart is doing this statewide effort with all the MPOs and the rural areas. Um, but uh, any of the MPOs are always welcome at any time to coordinate with Techstart for any additional changes outside of this particular evaluation cycle. If you want to make any change to any of these facilities, uh, there's no time restrictions as such, so you're more than welcome to uh, coordinate with Techstart and have that uh, happen on a separate um, uh, line of communica communication. So with that, I think uh, I added the few points that I had. Um, here, we're here to answer any questions that anyone might have. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a, a good point there. All right, let me open up to the technical committee to see if uh, there, you have any questions here. Chris, Frank Lales. Yes, sir. On this, uh, was the uh, super site and mega site considered on this or not? Uh, that that was part of uh, MPO staff's uh, evaluation, uh, but it is um, since it doesn't exist just yet, uh, it it is a little bit difficult to uh, say that um, you know that that's a consideration at this time. Uh, so that may be something to um, um, once it's in place, it may be a stronger um, consideration in the future. But it's been certified. Was you aware that it's been certified? Um, I guess, I guess that's new information. I knew it was uh, um, recommended, but I didn't uh, realize that the final decision was made. Yeah, it was already it certified. Okay. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's great. That's good to know. This is Akila again from TechStart. So again, um, that's why I mentioned that this is a periodic process. Uh, so once we do, we do recognize that these developments are being planned for, uh, but right now, based on the FHWA criteria, we cannot use a planned uh, improvement or development when we look at whether a facility has to be part of an NHS or not. But once it comes into existence, it will definitely be considered. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of reiterating that it, this is a, a periodic process. So a couple of years down the line, we'll be back again looking at all the facilities and if the developments have happened, we'll definitely be considering those facilities again. Any other questions? Hey, yeah, this is Victor. I got a question. 
so kind of along the line, same lines that Akilah was just talking about, that it's it's on a periodic basis where these are analyzed and looked at. Let's say uh, if there's a one-off situation that we would like to analyze now and maybe even request a change to happen now in, in one particular location. I mean, that's that's always an option available to us, right, as far as requesting the uh, functional classification change and, and national highway inclusion. That's my understanding. That 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 is correct. Yes, Victor, that, that is correct, yeah. So you can always, you're always welcome to make these requests. Uh, you know, it can be part of this evaluation if it comes within the timeline. If not, it can happen with a, as a separate um, effort as well. Any other questions? So we're going to handle this in two separate pieces here since we have two separate resolutions we'll be um, forwarding to the policy board. Uh, so we'd like to uh, handle uh, resolution 2020-8, uh, which is the uh, recommendations that uh, MPO staff and TxDOT staff are in agreement uh, and uh, see if anyone's willing to make a uh, uh, motion to recommend those changes. This is Zane with the county. I recommend uh, make a motion to recommend the changes. All right, I have a motion for approval. Is there a second? Frank Leo, second. It's Tom Dahl. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Frank beat you to the punch there. <laughs> so done. Uh, maybe, maybe on the next one. Um, so, um, so we have a motion by Zane and a second by Frank Leos uh, to approve resolution 2020-8. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? All right, seeing no discussion, I will call for the vote. Annette, uh, if you may do the roll call. Okay, so I'm just go going to list the people that that were here on attendance if you have if you joined us late please say something at the end so christy bonham approved okay uh, amy berlarley highland approved okay tom Dahl. approved okay zane dunham approved okay, uh, approved. Victor, okay. victor gable approved Jeff Jackson. Approved. Uh, Francisco Leos. Approved. Okay. Uh, uh, Serena Stevenson. Approved. Debbie Tahiri. Approved. And Clayton Zaka. Approved. Okay. All right. Did anyone join us on the call since the attendance at the beginning of the meeting? Okay, go ahead, Chris. All right, so the next action is resolution 2020-9. And uh, just as a reminder, this deals with uh, US 84. Uh, and uh, just as a reminder, uh, our the MPO staff recommendation here is uh, to maintain the section of US 84 from Loop 340 to the McGregor Airport as part of the NHS system, and then to continue that designation, at least as far as we're concerned, to uh, the McLennan Coriel County line. Um, and just as a reminder, the TxDOT recommendation is not for the continuation and then to remove this uh, section as currently on the NHS system uh, from the system. So uh, I will once again ask if there is a motion for approval of uh, resolution 2020-9. Chris, this is Zane with the county. I make a recommendation that we keep in uh, US 84 from Highway 6 to McGregor Airport and include uh, from McGregor Airport to the Coriel County line. 
Okay. Is there a second on that motion? Chris, this is Tom Dahl with City of Waco. I second that motion. All right. I have a, a motion for approval consistent with staff's recommendation from Sane Dunham and a second from Tom Dahl. Is there any discussion on that motion? Okay, hearing none, I will call for the vote. Annette, uh, please poll the committee. Christy Bonham. Approve. Amy Berlarley Highland. Approve. Uh, Tom Dahl. Approve. Okay, Zane Denham. Approve. Okay. Victor Gable. Approve. Jeff Jackson. Approve. Uh, Frank Laos. Approve. Uh, Serena Stevenson. Approve. Okay. Debbie Tahiri. Approve. And Clayton Zaka. Approve. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Chris. All right. Uh, thank you. We will forward those recommendations to the policy board and uh, they will be considering action on those resolutions during their se September 17th meeting. All right. Um, at this point, what I want to do, and, and I apologize to those of you who have called in, I'd like to go ahead and jump on the agenda um, a couple of spots in advance uh, for a topic that has um, become uh, urgent and has uh, a lot of changing parts to it. Uh, and so uh, for those of you who have called in and are uh, following along with our PowerPoint that was online, uh, we're going to jump ahead to um, slide 38 on the um, um, presentation. And this is a review and discussion regarding short-term changes to highway funding <clears throat> as a result of economic impacts of COVID-19 and potential amendments to the fiscal year 2021-2024 Transportation Improvement Program. Um, I'm also going to do a further apology here. I did add a slide to this uh, slide deck. Uh, those of you who are accessing through uh, the computer, uh, you're going to see this. Uh, those of you who are calling in, I apologize, you're not going to see this. <clears throat> it's not part of the um, uh, I actually added this in uh, a little over an hour ago. Um, and for some things that are changing at the very last minute here, uh, based on conversations we've had with some of the policy board leadership, <coughs> as well as uh, Waco district staff. Um, <clears throat> we will get this uh, adjusted uh, power deck or PowerPoint slide deck uh, onto our website uh, as quickly as we can so that way then you can verify that um, uh, I'm not feeding you a line here. Uh, but I want to make sure that we uh, go ahead and cover this um, before we get to some of the other items. Uh, so on slide 39, you may remember that back in June we adopted <coughs> the 2021-2024 uh, Transportation Improvement Program. Um, that includes uh, those projects that were uh, identified in TxDOT's Unified Transportation Program as being ready to go to construction um, within the next four-year time frame. Um, although at the time we advised the uh, both the Technical Committee and Policy Board that we we're probably going to see some uh, or need to explore some changes as a result of uh, revenues uh, being significantly less uh, as a result of the COVID-19 disruption. Uh, the next slide I've got here actually shows the um, revenues that are relevant to transportation. Uh, this comes straight to us from the state comptroller. Uh, and basically after March, everything uh, really went down significantly. And in some cases are as much as 80% less than what we were seeing last year for the same time period. Um, 
So we knew some changes were going to have to be made uh, as a result of that. Um, but there are some other changes that uh, are coming down the pike um, that um, are not um, related um, to the COVID situation that we're still going to have to deal with. So um, August 18th, uh, we sat down with district staff and we were given the bad news that uh, we're going to have to look at removing $70 million from our TIP. Now, that's a little more than half of what we identified back in June. Um, and I don't necessarily have the full answer about uh, what's going on, but basically the, the gist of this is that statewide, uh, there are just too many projects proposed for the next four years. Um, and it, it's well beyond uh, the fiscal constraint that's been identified uh, for that time period. Uh, to give you some idea of what some other regions are facing, uh, the Killeen Temple area has a similar amount that they need to remove from their tip. Uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area is looking at over a billion dollars to, to remove. Uh, the Houston-Galveston area is looking at over 1.2 billion uh, out of their uh, tip. Uh, so this is a pretty significant uh, adjustment. Uh, and it's not because uh, there's a change in revenue over the 10 year time frame. What it is is that too many projects are in the first four years of that unified transportation program. Um, so um, the scary thing here is that the COVID impacts that I mentioned to you just now are gonna be on top of this. Um, so what I'm gonna do is kind of walk you through uh, some of what our initial conversations have been with the Waco District about how are we going to um, um, address this change in funding, um, but also <clears throat> that's changed uh, in the interim uh, after our conversations with some of the policy board leadership and also with the district staff. Um, so uh, you're going to see a game plan slide here. Uh, but um, we're going to be changing this up a little bit, and let me kind of walk through that now. So back in June, we had $130 million identified uh, in our four-year TIP for highway projects. Uh, that involves five projects, and what we're going to do here is we're going to review each of those five projects and some of the considerations for each of those, some of the moving parts, what those costs are, and, um, and while we don't want you to ignore those considerations, for the exercise that we have today, what I want you to focus on is which of these projects you think are more important for us to focus our limited resources on, which of the projects do you think may be more appropriate to tap our brakes on for the time being. And that's what we want to forward to the policy board when they address this question uh, on September 17th. Um, so you'll see here that initially on our game plan, we were thinking about postponing the projects that we had for our fiscal year 2023. That would involve the mall to mall project, that would involve this a section of Highway 6 out towards the Spiegelville area uh, that would widen that road from four lanes, uh, well from the current three lane design to a five lane design through the FM185 interchange. Um, again, there's some perspective uh, that the mall to mall project may be the most important project that we have um, you know, in the pipeline right now. Uh, and that uh, the next, well, actually, let me talk about the I-35 breakouts because whatever action we ultimately take, it's pretty much going to come down to, do we do mall to mall or do we do I-35, but we're not gonna be able to do both right now. So the I-35 breakouts, this is mostly a frontage road project and on an off-ramp project uh, between Valley Mills Drive and New Road. Uh, it actually extends a little bit south of New Road, uh, but um, it also replaces the main lane bridges over New Road. Now the original cost we had was $48 million. The latest estimate from the district is that it's $33 million. Um, and that is, that is a consideration there because that actually, um, if we went with I-35 rather than mall to mall, 
that at least has the possibility of keeping uh, the Spring Valley project, which is on the next slide, not next slide yet, um, but it keeps the Spring Valley or FM2113 project moving forward, and so we need to talk about that as well. Um, one of the considerations we need to think about with I-35 is that the policy board was pretty clear um, that uh, the only reason they're supporting this at this time is because of the, the ability to get that work completed before the current construction project finishes. Uh, the policy board is definitely um, construction weary with Interstate 35. They're ready to move on. Um, they really don't want to see any significant construction continuing past the, the current uh, timeline. So a delay of one or two years to this uh, breakout project, at least based on that uh, feedback and guidance we got earlier, um, it almost equates to maybe a five to 10 year delay uh, in reality. Um, again, don't focus so much on that at this time because there's a lot of sausage making going on behind the scenes. And so there may be other way, other old, um, options maybe to keep keep some of these other projects moving forward. So again, the considerations are important, but what we really want to get your feedback on is um, how is I-35 uh, an important level relative to the mall-to-mall -mall project? Now the considerations for mall-to-mall -mall is that our understanding it was that it wasn't going to be ready for construction until 2023 at the earliest. Um, that may change also. Uh, that, um, and um, so, uh, Victor, uh, we talked about this a little bit uh, just uh, a little bit before the technical committee meeting. Um, uh, would it be okay if you kind of gave a, a little bit of a briefing on what you told me uh, on the mall to mall project? Sure, sure. So, yeah, we went, we're, we're pushing the mall to mall plans and trying to get them out. We are on schedule. Actually, to have the plans complete within, we could probably do a letting here in fiscal year 21 if we had to. The only thing that's holding us up right now is utility relocations. Um, and that's basically the city of Waco utilities, which, um, you know, it, we, we could work with them and try to get them moved, but certainly we could let it sooner than 23 if we need to, if the, as long as we can get those utility relocations done sooner than that. But basically looking at these five projects that we have listed in the, in the SIP right now, or the TIP, that mall-to-mall -to, -mall to us at the TxDOT side is, is basically the best bang for buck that you get out of all these five projects as far as traffic movement and safety and, and just cleaning up the Highway 6 area out there. All right, thanks, Victor. So I mentioned there are two other projects at play here. Uh, I've already mentioned the Spring Valley Road project. Uh, this is in Hewitt. Uh, it's basically widening it to three lanes, but there's some pretty important drainage improvements on that facility. There's also some uh, pedestrian improvements in the vicinity of the Spring Valley Elementary School. I think the city of Hewitt folks would tell you that this is, is something they've been waiting 30 years for. It's pretty important. Um, but there's also maybe a possibility of being able to fund this through a different uh, pot of money. Uh, and that's something that the district folks are, are taking a look at to see uh, what opportunities there are there. And then there's the Highway 31 overpasses uh, at FM 2311 and FM 939. Uh, by the way, those of you following us <clears throat> on the phone and not seeing the uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, live, this is the additional slide that um, I mentioned to you that I added here. <clears throat> so um, Spring Valley Road is $12 million, but only 10 million of that comes from a mobility uh, pot of money. Uh, the other two million comes from TxDOT's maintenance uh, fund. And then the Highway 31 overpasses is a $20 million project. Uh, but we consider that a very high priority just because of the fatal and serious injury crashes that are occurring at, those, at each of those intersections. Um, 
I mean, I think the city of Waco has a small little uh, project that might be taking place out that way also that might be a consideration as well. Um, so the, um, so those are the five projects. So let me refresh your memory on the five projects here. So in fiscal year 21, we have sp uh, the Spring Valley Road project. We have the State Highway 31 overpasses and we have the I-35 breakouts. This year, 23, for the time being, we have the Mall to Mall project, and then we have a section of Highway 6 project out uh, past Spiegelville. Um, so how do that mix of projects? We need to remove about $70 million. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly $70 million, but it needs to be close. Um, and um, as I mentioned, for some of these projects, there may be another way to actually fund them, such as in the case of Spring Valley Road. Uh, so um, one of the challenges here is that uh, it's entirely possible that some of these considerations uh, could very, and some of the information could very well change between now and the policy board meeting. Um, but this is the best information we have at this time. We we'll go to the next slide, and this is where we pick up again in the uh, slide deck that is online. Um, I mentioned earlier that none of this deals with the impacts relayed from the COVID-19 disruptions. Um, but one of the things I get to do as the director of the Texas MPO Association is I get to meet with the TxDOT finance folks every year, along with six of my counterparts to review their long range financial forecast. And uh, we did that just uh, about um, 10 days ago. And they're uh, forecasting that these impacts are actually gonna hit the system for fiscal years 22, 20, and 23, possibly into 24. But that at that point, we should be seeing some type of uh, recovery back to where we were pre-COVID. Uh, and that is based on the recovery rate that we saw during the Great Recession of 2009. It's also based on some uh, recommendations or guidance that they're receiving from uh, their investment folks on Wall Street. And so uh, this is actually fairly typical that you see an impact from some type of uh, change in finances hit about a year after you actually see the impact. Uh, and, and that's when you see the impact to actually programming of projects. Um, we also understand that for fiscal year 21, uh, there is a um, bit of a challenge in that there do, may not be enough projects ready to go to construction to use the money that's at, at least on the table right now. Um, so once again, there may be an opportunity to fund um, projects over and above, um, you know, maybe a little bit over and above what we would normally be um, uh, uh, programming based on the guidance that we've received previously, because we do have projects ready to go to construction. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, we have, and the district have work, been working really hard to get projects that are in the pipeline, they're ready to go, and that gives us a whole lot of flexibility that a lot of other regions do not have uh, to be able to move uh, projects forward because oftentimes there is money that uh, becomes available that isn't part of an official forecast. Um, and so this gives us the opportunity to maybe move something forward that another region won't be able to because they're just not ready to go. Uh, so uh, I certainly want to uh, thank the Waco District and their staff for, for working really hard to get uh, our projects ready. Uh, that's a huge advantage to our region. Um, so I um, wanted to make sure that gets uh, expressed there. All right, so um, what we're asking you to consider here, or, or to at least give us some feedback here is, once again, what, which of these projects um, are most appropriate to move forward on. Uh, we'll present that to the policy board at their next meeting on September 17th and have the conversation about uh, what their preference is. Uh, and we'll fashion a TIP amendment based on that guidance. Um, and that TIP amendment would come to you at your October 1st meeting. Uh, and then 
uh, we would um, proceed uh, for adoption on October 15th for the policy board and in between now and then, or in between the 17th and, and October 15th, we would conduct our public process to find out from the public what they think uh, we ought to be uh, focusing our resources on. And then if that isn't enough, there are some complications here. Um, we're looking at several billion dollars worth of changes to the TIP. Uh, as you can imagine, that's going to take time, especially for some larger metropolitan areas. Uh, how do you remove a billion dollars in four years? Uh, and uh, I imagine that they're going to have a lot of uh, very colorful conversation in their regions on that. Um, and it probably uh, this may very well result in a delay to the approval of the current uh, statewide TIP. Um, now, Federal Highways does have the option to approve a partial step, uh, statewide TIP. So our goal here is to get our work done as soon as we can. And, and if we can get it done by October, I think that that's a good time frame. Um, and hopefully that means that Federal Highways would be willing to uh, do a partial step approval for our region. Um, and then we wouldn't have to wait for other regions that maybe still have some work to do. So, so that's kind of what we're trying to work on. But again, um, I know Federal Highways doesn't prefer to do business that way. They prefer to just do a one approval at one time. Um, and they certainly have that option to do so. Uh, so um, just want to let everyone know that it's possible we could see some delays uh, to being able to get uh, started on work. Um, um, and so with that, um, I'd like to open up for conversation here and just kind of get the uh, folks' um, thoughts about what direction you think is appropriate uh, on this topic. Chris, this is Zane with the county. I had two things um, say. One is I, I agree with Victor in the mall to mall project. Um, mm -hmm. Probably should be moved with with the understanding that it could be led in fiscal year twenty one. Uh, I think that should be moved to higher priority than the other ones. And I, second, secondly, I applaud TxDOT for having the foresight and the putting in the the hard work to get that to a point where it could potentially be led in fiscal year 21. I know that's not an easy task, and so I give, uh, applaud them on their efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Zane. This is Amy. I, I agree with Zane. I mean, I think the highest priority is the mall to mall, particularly given the economic development we have over there right now, and the fact that we know there'll be immediate benefit once we get that project done. Um, and I also agree, Chris, with your comment about the I-35 commuters being sort of construction weary at this point in time. Thank you, Amy. Any other conversation? Um, well, seeing, yes, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so what would be the total that we would be deferring? So if 70 we, million what, is what we, 70 million is what we need to defer. Okay, but what, what is the, uh, the amount that we're looking at? We're, we're trying we to get to. The mall, yeah, mall to mall. If we push mall to mall, what are the projects left over would be the total amount? So 60 million is the total, mall to mall is 44 million. So it really means all we have, uh, all we can actually probably get done after that is uh, probably the uh, Highway 31 overpasses uh, based on um, the priority that's been uh, expressed to us by the policy board. It's still a little bit uh, more than 60 million, but the initial feedback uh, we've received is that that may be close enough. But then the other three projects would, would have to be postponed. 
Okay. Thank you. Can I make can I make some comments, Chris? This is Victor. Yes. So, and and I just kind of want to go back to and kind of the reason that, that we're in this or what happened is I believe it was the 2018 UTP where they changed up the way the strategy that, that the CAT2 funds were allocated. Uh, before that in the UTP, you would basically get a certain allocation of CAT2 funds every year. Say if you got five, five million a year, if you wanted to let a $10 million job, you'd have to wait two years in order to let that $10 million job. You bankroll that five million the first year and then spend 10 million the next. Um, so yeah, they, they broke away from that in the 2018 UTP and basically said it's a 10 year plan. Districts and MPOs go, go program up your 10 years worth of allocations. And Waco MPO was very good at that. So was KTMPO and so was every other MPO in the state. And that what happened is everybody programmed their 10 years worth within the first four to five years of the, of the 10 year UTP. And obviously that's, that's not being fiscally constrained. So in saying that, in the 21 UTP that just came out, they're going back to that yearly allocation again. And it sounds like we are going to have to go back to keeping within our allocations and bankroll in those years for the larger projects. Um, once we get into constraint, like we're trying to do here, yes, we're going to we'll try to let these projects as quick as we can, knowing that or not knowing what the future holds as far as the, the allocations and the cash flow. But if we do push these projects out of this step, as we go on year by year, you know, we'll have future steps. We can try to bring them back in as we get those allocations coming back online. So just because we push them out now doesn't mean that we can't bring them back in at a, at a later step and still let them within a, a, a reasonable time frame. So I just wanted to kind of lay that out there and, and kind of the way we're looking at it as, as, the, as the funds become more available, we will be trying to bring these other projects back in, whichever ones we do end up moving out, that is. Thanks, Victor. That's that's an important point. Uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of the projects we've done have been the result of um, funding that either the Congress or the state legislature have identified that weren't on anyone's radar screen previously. So, um, you know, for instance, uh, there's still talk about a COVID uh, highway stimulus. Um, I don't know if that's actually going to happen, but uh, you know, that uh, certainly not before the election, but there's still uh, opportunities there. So um, once again, by having projects ready to go, um, that gives us that gives us a huge advantage over a lot of other regions. Um, it sounds like uh, folks uh, preference is uh, that mall to mall is uh, the, the highest priority here. That probably implies that Highway 31 overpasses would be the other project would move forward. And then the other three, we would probably pump the brakes on for the time being. Um, and then, um, of course, if uh, anything changes uh, based on our conversation with the policy board or um, there are some other things happening behind the scenes that um, are new, we'll communicate that to the uh, tech committee uh, at your next meeting. So um, if, let me just make sure there's no other conversation folks have here. And uh, before we move on to the uh, regularly scheduled programming. All right. Um, so we'll go ahead and go back up to where we were supposed to be on the agenda, um, which is slide 24 for those of you following along from our uh, Power, PowerPoint deck online. Uh, this is text.vision0. Uh, and um, what we wanted to do is just do kind of a, a quick review of uh, some action that the Com Transportation Commission took last year. Uh, and they actually adopted the aspirational goal of eliminating all fatal crashes by the year 2050. And then furthermore, reducing uh, those fatalities by 50% uh, by the year 2035. Uh, and that, that basically represents a straight line reduction year to year um, uh, of, I, I think it's about 8% a year. Um, now this is different from the targets that have officially been adopted by uh, TxDOT to comply with uh, the FAST Act. 
uh, which you might remember uh, is to reduce fatalities by 2%, but relative to a baseline trend. And that still actually results in more fatalities year over year, but it's better than if we did nothing at all. And it kind of it um, concedes that uh, if we only look at things from an engineering and design perspective, uh, our effectiveness at uh, achieving these uh, uh, reductions is probably limited. So there's other conversations that would need to take place in order to eliminate fatal crashes. And I think that's what the commission is trying to get at and is asking for MPO's help um, uh, regarding that. Now, just to as a reminder, if the state of Texas actually fails to achieve the safety target, uh, the FAST Act does say that uh, a portion of uh, Texas's uh, allocation of federal dollars does have to be redistributed to try to uh, get after uh, that, um, uh, try to improve the safety situation. Um, and so it re removes a little bit of flexibility of how you use the federal dollars. Uh, and so, of course, we, we would prefer to have maximum flexibility. Um, what we wanted to do is kind of do a review, uh, to, kind of to kick off this conversation that we'd like to uh, have, start uh, having in more detail uh, moving forward. But uh, we want to give you a, a little bit of perspective on the characteristics of fatal crashes within uh, McLean County um, and use this as a starting point for the conversation. Uh, so this first slide, slide 26, uh, is the three-year rolling average for fatal crashes since 2010. This information comes straight from TxDOT's CRIS system. Um, and uh, what you see here is that we were actually going through a pretty good decline or reduction uh, from 2010 up to about 2016, and then we started going uh, back up. Um, when we compare this to the next slide, which is all crashes in McLennan County, this includes everything from fender benders to the fatal crashes. Um, this trend line, however, has been going consistently upwards. Uh, now, this is actually uh, mirroring the, pop the estimated population growth of the region. Uh, so this uh, is not necessarily inconsistent with or, or a faster trend than we would uh, necessarily expect. Um, but it's interesting to note that the fatal crashes were doing something a little bit different. The next slide uh, are some selected crash factors uh, comparing fatal crashes to all crashes uh, since 2010. Uh, and uh, it's true what they say, speed kills. Uh, speed was cited as a factor in more than a third of all fatal crashes, where it is probably more of a factor in one out of four of all crashes. Uh, the really big difference is alcohol or drug involvement, and uh, almost a third of fatal crashes within our region had uh, involved alcohol or drugs, whereas it's a very small percentage of the total uh, of all crashes. Uh, interestingly enough, distracted driving or inattention was actually more of a factor for, for all crashes. Um, and then looking at the high angle collisions, which are characterized by the fail to yield right of way or disregarding stop sign or stop light, um, you know, as expected, those are, um, uh, there's a higher percentage of fatal crashes than uh, of total. Um, just because those high angle crashes, uh, more of the force is applied to uh, the occupants of the vehicle um, than other types of crashes. When we get to uh, slide 29, uh, we, um, we looked at mode and location here. And uh, no surprise, bicycle and pedestrian involvement was far more uh, prevalent for fatal crashes than for total crashes, uh, from the simple reason that uh, bicyclists and pedestrians have very limited protection. Um, in fact, pedestrians have none at all, whereas a bicyclist may be wearing a helmet. Um, commercial vehicles, um, again, are also overrepresented on fatal crashes, uh, but this is the laws of physics involved here. Uh, commercial vehicles are much heavier, uh, and so a, a crash involving these vehicles are not are much more likely to result in a poor outcome. 
um, rural uh, or rural uh, location for crashes, uh, much more likely to be the case for fatal crashes. Uh, this is probably related to speed. Rural roads generally have higher posted speed limits and, and higher um, observed speeds uh, than non-rural locations. And state highways is basically a similar, uh, similar uh, perspective. Uh, state highways are generally more uh, located in rural areas and, and also generally have higher posted speeds than non-state highways. And so uh, again, uh, we see a higher percentage on the fatal side. And then we also looked at Interstate 35. Interestingly enough, the percentage is very, very similar. Um, probably because, once again, uh, speed is probably the, the same uh, factor for all crashes. Um, the final two slides here, uh, we looked at time of day and day of week. Uh, the fatal crashes are more uh, represented on week Friday, or well, in this case, it's time of day. It's more in the overnight period than for total crashes. And then total crashes, have a definite peak during the PM uh, peak period uh, when there's more traffic volume. And then when we look at uh, day of week, uh, again, fatal crashes are overrepresented weekends, whereas uh, the weekday periods uh, see a slightly higher percentage for total crashes. So we wanted to give you some of those statistics just to kind of give you uh, an opening discussion um, and to start beginning the conversation about what kind of things do we need to be discussing and talking about and including in our plans and programs uh, to start uh, moving the needle um, in the direction of eliminating these types of crashes. So uh, let me open up to see if there's any uh, discussion uh, from the membership. So um, this is something that we'll be probably discussing periodically over the next year or two, um, probably involving some other stakeholders, uh, you know, probably some folks from, um, uh, say, first responders, from uh, public, uh, from law enforcement, um, to at least begin the conversation. Uh, but we certainly um, uh, appreciate any con conversation or any input that members of the technical committee might have to. Um, for this conversation. Um, so let me go ahead and move on to the last agenda item here before we get to uh, Clayton's review of construction. Uh, and that is uh, we, we're continuing our review of impacts from the COVID-19 disruption here. And one of the things that uh, we looked at was crash trends. Um, and we noted earlier that traffic volumes did decrease significantly uh, between March and June, uh, not just in our region, but nationwide. Um, but what other regions were observing in terms of crashes is that while the total number of crashes went down, uh, the most serious crashes, the fatal and serious injury crashes actually got worse. And the idea being that you didn't have the traffic congestion that you had previously, so folks were physically able to drive faster. And speed is the primary factor in uh, the difference between uh, a serious injury or fatal crashes as opposed to something of less severity. So what we want to see is, is this occurring in our region? Is this a, uh, is a similar trend occurring in our region? If not, why not? And you know, what was our experience relative to some of our peer communities? Uh, so first of all, uh, slide 34 here. Um, we looked at just total crashes uh, going all the way back to 2015 here. Uh, this is a three month rolling average. Um, you see some seasonality impact here, but once you got to the very end, yes, big drop off in total crashes. Okay, so check the box here, yes, we had fewer crashes than what we had um, during a normal um, March to June timeframe. Um, if you plot out 
On that same uh, three-month rolling average, the fatal crashes and serious injury crashes, however, much harder to discern uh, a pattern here. So we have to dive into this a little bit more detail. And so um, we looked at just uh, the, the March to June timeframe and then compared that to what we saw in the um, five years previous uh, to 2020 uh, to see, okay, is this significantly different from what we would normally see on average for that same four month period? Um, we'll start off at the bottom here because Excel does things backwards. Um, change in miles per person. Uh, we also compared this to uh, Bell County, Lubbock County, Smith County, and Harris County. We want to do more, but uh, in the time constraints, we want to um, <clears throat> at least get those out. Uh, everyone saw a significant decrease in my miles of travel per person, and everyone saw a significant decrease in total crashes. Uh, when you look at fatal crashes, though, um, we actually observed a decrease in the actual number of those types of crashes, whereas everyone actually observed an increase, um, which is interesting. Serious injuries, while everyone saw a decrease, our decrease was much more significant in the actual numbers of those types of crashes than these other four counties. <clears throat> one of the things we're now, one of the things we're going to look at is see, okay, um, are some other counties more similar to us than, than these four that we've chosen here? And then when we take a look at um, percent of total, uh, so it's one thing to look at the absolute numbers. The other thing is we, we want to see, okay, is, is the percent of total here uh, changing? And, and uh, that gives us the answer to, are we seeing a, a greater uh, proportion of, of the more severe crashes? And for fatalities, the answer is clearly yes for the counties that we were doing comparison to. For us, it was a small increase, but because the total number was pretty small, it ends up not being statistically significant. So officially, we're going to call our change as no change uh, for fatal crashes. Uh, but for serious injuries, um, again, we had a very significant decrease. That ends up being a very significant uh, decrease in the percent of total. So the end result is for some reason, our experience was very, very different from what some of our other peer communities were experiencing. So now the next question is, why is that? We're going to start looking at trying to explain that to see if there's uh, just something unique to our area or was there something else going on that uh, might be applicable um, uh, or something that we might want to be uh, looking at for for this conversation about trying to reduce the severity of crashes or, or eliminating fatal crashes uh, moving into the future. So once again, let me pause here to see if there's any questions on this uh, or any comments. Chris, this is Debbie Tahiri. Yeah. I just had a question. What time frame was this again? Um, because I'm wondering, you know, McLennan County seemed to have kind of shut down um, but I could tell sooner than others. And so I was just wondering if, if this is taking that into account, maybe, you know, we kind of started encouraging people, our mayor said, you know, hey, y'all need to stay home sooner from than from some of these other regions. Right, so we look at March 1st to June 30th. And, uh, and you're correct, there was about a one week or maybe a 10 day you know, window there where some folks were shutting down earlier, like us, <coughs> excuse me, or maybe a little bit uh, later, uh, like in the case of uh, Smith County or even Lubbock County. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, um, for, for that entire four-month period, it, it didn't end up affecting those numbers uh, um, real dramatically. It was probably about a seven to ten day difference in that window. Uh, but we did look at that, yeah. Okay. Other comments or questions? So, um, we'll, this is something um, 
that we'll keep paying uh, some attention to moving forward. Uh, I don't think anyone thinks that we're really beyond um, the impacts of COVID-19 for, for some time. So we're gonna be tracking how this changes travel patterns or uh, may change um, <clears throat> other aspects of how we get from point A to point B. Uh, and if anything uh, significant comes out, uh, we'll, we'll share that with you and, and maybe even some takeaways uh, about things that might be more, um, more of a permanent change that we may need to account for in our, our planning and program. All right, uh, so um, with that, we're going to um, skip ahead. Um, and we're going to now, uh, Clayton, uh, let you go ahead and do your um, project updates um, for construction within our region. All right, we'll start with Hewitt Drive. We started this project actually in July. It's a sidewalk and ADA upgrade between Mars Drive and Panther Way. Estimates just under a million dollars. Uh, that contractor's, I'm sure if you've seen, he's uh, hit the ground running out there, got the majority of the sidewalk and concrete work done along Hewitt Drive. Uh, we've got a little bit of, of handrail and some specialty curb that's on order right now to get that wrapped up. Uh, they've got a subcontractor that's actually going to be coming in, hopefully right after Labor Day, to start on the sidewalk down Panther Way. Uh, we hope to have all of the concrete work done by the end of the year. And then their signal subcontractor will be coming in to work on the pedestrian buttons and other signal upgrades throughout the project. So right now we're looking at a uh, expected completion of next summer. All right, next project here is 1637 phase three. It's another one that's really kind of picked up the progress in the last few months. Uh, our contractors completed the vast majority of the widening on the project. We only lack probably about three miles or so now towards the China Spring end of the job. Uh, there's been a lot of Seal coat and hot mix put down on the northern portion of that project going into Bosque County. Uh, the contractors are also working on putting in the new signal there at Bob Johnson Road by the school. And again, we expect this project to be wrapped up by hopefully the late October timeframe. All right, then moving on to 35. Uh, through July, contractors completed about $170 million worth of work actually just saw the August estimate come through while we were sitting here and it's a, roughly another $12 million or so in, in August. Uh, still projecting an on-time finish. Uh, throughout the project, we're, we're getting closer and closer to wrapping up water and wastewater relocations. Uh, the vast majority of our work is just the bores under the interstate. Uh, we expect those to be wrapped up within the next six months. We do have a 24 inch crossing at 4th Street that that mid-September date's probably pushed a little bit to late September, but that'll be a several week impact to the 4th Street area to get that work completed and tie in. All right, then moving on, southbound frontage road. Uh, we can officially report that traffic is now on concrete from one end of the project to the other with the opening of the, uh, the section from 5th to 12th on Saturday. Uh, we were hoping to have side streets tied in starting this week, but obviously weather has played a big factor down there and uh, push some of that work on to next week. Uh, we should start tying in 6th, 8th, and 10th after Labor Day and then alternate closures from there to get those side streets completed and reopened. Uh, moving to the northbound frontage road side, there's been a lot of concrete pavement put down since our last meeting. Uh, we were actually planning to pave around the 16th and Spate area earlier this week as well and again weathers has pushed that schedule. So coming back from Labor Day, you should see concrete pavement pick up down around 16th and Spate. Uh, and then from there, you'll really see it picking up from Forest Street all the way up to Loop 340, kind of filling in some of the gaps that are left uh, in between the concrete pavement we've already placed. Uh, moving to the south end, back to the south end, we did pave a portion of the northbound frontage road and right turn lane at U Parks. Uh, there's a little bit more pavement to put on the ground there, but we expect to have that short section of concrete pavement and the new right turn lane to University Park parks open later in September and what that'll allow us to do is build the remainder of the frontage road from U Parks working back to the south at 8th Street and complete that connection. So towards the end of the year you should see a lot of progress on that south end of the northbound frontage road. And then again 
Uh, with that northbound frontage road, you'll see a lot of work going on at the Business 77 intersection and the US 84 intersection on the east side of the interstate uh, through the fall. Let's see, I don't, then moving on to the main lanes, uh, continuing to build retaining wall and bridges from one end to the other. Uh, we've, we've completed the demo of every structure that was out there prior to us starting. 11th, 12th Street bridge deck, we were going to pour this week, but that's been rescheduled. Uh, 4th, 5th, that bridge deck's been poured. Uh, University Park should be poured in September. Brazos River, we're in the process of setting beams. And again, weather, weather got us this week, but uh, they were able to get a, a, a good start on it anyway. Uh, MLK, we should be setting the steel beams. Later this month, early part of October, and completing that bridge deck later this fall. Uh, railroad, we're almost done with our final bridge abutment, and then should be setting beams in late September, early October there. Uh, business 77, we should be setting beams in October. Those are still beams, so we've got a little bit of lead time with fabrication. Uh, US 84, uh, that work will really pick up in October again as well. And then same thing for Baron Circle. And then again, you can see visible progress from one end to the other with all the retaining wall going up. So right now we're still projecting a, a early 2021 switch on a new pavement at the south end of the main lanes. That'll be roughly from business 77 to the south end. And then the new southbound main lanes, the entire length of the project hopefully opened up uh, spring, summer timeframe of next year. With that, I'll, I'll open it up to any questions anybody may have. Any questions? Clay, this is Frank Leos. Yes, sir, Frank. Uh, was there any seeding or watering on the uh, Spiegelville project? Uh, it's all in the bottom of the ditch now after this rain, but <laughs> we, we did get a, a good portion of it seeded prior to it raining. Uh, we're gonna have to obviously go back and address some things now before we finish up that project. It's still in a vegetative establishment period, so we'll make sure that vegetation is, is uh, consistent throughout the project before we buy off on it. Okay, but I just, there's a lot of erosion on that side slope side. So yeah, and we, we're looking at using some sod in some places to speed up the process there, Frank, and hopefully eliminate that, but we, we are working on it. Uh, okay. All right, any other questions? Chris, I was gonna say we uh, we got some more drone photos of the project this month. So next okay. month, if it's okay, I may show some of those at, at the techno commit, technical committee meeting and the policy board. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I, I think uh, we got a lot of positive uh, feedback last time. Okay. All right, we'll get those in October. Awesome. All right, um, and as always, uh, if a question comes up in the interim, uh, Clayton is always uh, available if you've got something um, that you've got burning uh, question on. Um, so the next meeting is Thursday, October 1st, uh, same bat time, same bat place. Um, right now we're looking at the possible amendments uh, that, that we just talked about to the tip uh, and then um, we have uh, the usual uh, discussion about updates from uh, text on construction activities. Uh, as far as meeting format, uh, at least through the end of the year, we're anticipating being in a virtual format. Um, it's starting to look like that may continue even uh, into the early next year. Um, but, um, you know, we'll We'll give you updates on that if it looks like that may be, uh, that we may be switching back to an in-person format if, if, if that uh, is something on, on um, our uh, radar screen. But for right now, expect uh, Zoom meetings for the foreseeable future. Uh, that's all I have for you. That's probably enough. I uh, kept you longer than normal, but uh, thank you for your patience here. Um, and uh, if, unless anyone else has any questions or 